Hello everyone, this is The Astro Geek Comics, where I talk about astronomy and space science through my fondness for art. If you would enjoy sci art comics based on astronomy and space sciences, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is at the rate The Astro Geek Comics. This video is the third in line in the series Astronomical Spectroscopy. In the last video, I talked about the emission and the absorption spectrum and how these spectrums are unique for every element. The spectrum of an element is its fingerprint, its ID. The fine line spectrums are a result of the energy released or absorbed during electron transitions in the atoms between different energy states. In this video, we shall see how big revelations open the door to chemical analysis of celestial bodies extending to the limits of, of the observable universe. In the early 1800s, using better prisms, it was found that the spectrum of light from the sun wasn't exactly continuous, but had dark bands or lines all over it. These lines cannot be observed in our daily experience, but can be resolved using better instruments. It was Fraunhofer who found out that these were the absorption lines of the elements that make up the sun. In total, he found 574 absorption lines in the spectrum. Even today, some of these lines are not accounted for and might belong to the much higher excited states of elements. One interesting fact related to this is that helium, a noble gas used in balloons, was actually first discovered on the Sun before it was discovered on Earth. In 1868, Norman Lockyer and Pierre Janssen found the D3 line at 587.5 nanometers belongs to the then undiscovered element, which was named after the Greek god of Sun, Helios, as helium. Later in the next year, the spectra of the Sun's corona taken during a total solar eclipse showed the existence of an earlier unknown green line, which was taken as a sign of a new element too, and then called coronium, because it was observed only in the corona. Later, it revealed that this line was actually due to the higher or super ionized state of iron, which was in the Fe13 plus state which is possible in the high temperatures of the sun's corona, which reach up to 3 million degrees Celsius. Later, similarly high ionized states were discovered for nickel and calcium too. So what does an absorption spectrum of a star look like? Well, in visible light, it looks like the absorption spectrum, which has the absorption lines on the background of the whip gear. But when you graph the intensities of the different wavelengths against their respective wavelengths, it looks like a bell curve with dips in intensity at specific wavelengths corresponding to the absorption lines of the elements present in the star. So how do we understand this curve? The star's source of energy is the nuclear fission taking place inside its core. Here atoms of lighter elements like hydrogen are moving at high velocities colliding and fusing to form heavier elements like helium and in the process release a mind-boggling amount of energy. This energy is spread out in the whole wavelength and is the continuous spectrum represented by the bell curve. This energy peaks around a certain region of the electromagnetic spectrum based on the star's temperature. The core of the star is much hotter than the envelope of the ionized gases surrounding it. These gases are cold compared to it. For an idea, the temperature of the sun's core is 15 million degrees Celsius, while its surface is at 5800 degrees Celsius. As discussed in the previous video of this series, a cold gas surrounding a hotter source of energy will absorb radiation corresponding to electron transitions and because of it the final spectrum reaching the observer will have missing dark bands or lines on the continuous background radiation. These absorption lines are the dips in the intensity of the spectrum. 
A study of the sun has also led to the knowledge that it has about 67 elements. Fraunhofer later used this art of determining elements in a celestial body by looking at the light coming from it and found elements present on the moon, Venus, Mars and even Betelgeuse, a red supergiant star. So how does this knowledge of elements help us? Well, in the case of stars, it can help us determine their generation. Stars have been classified as population 1, population 2 and population 3 stars. Population 3 stars were the first stars to form after the Big Bang and have no metals present, only hydrogen and helium to begin with. Population 2 stars formed from the nebulae in which the population 3 stars were burst and some of the metals created by the population 3 stars are present in the population 2 stars. Population 1 stars are metal rich stars that have comparably high amount of metals. In astronomy, everything higher than helium in the periodic table is usually referred to as a metal. Sun and almost every star we see is a population 1 star. Methusela, the suspected oldest star in the universe to be discovered is a population 2 star. I have actually made a comic on it on my Instagram so you can check it out later and the number of the comic will be mentioned in the description below. Spectral analysis of stars will help us identify older stars and study them to understand the after events of the Big Bang and the initial star formation better. This technique is also used to study the chemical composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets which are the planets that go around the stars other than the sun. When an exoplanet passes in front of its host star as observed from Earth, this event is called transitioning and is also used to detect them. During the transitioning of the exoplanet, the light from the star passes through its atmosphere before reaching us. The atmosphere's elements will absorb specific energies from the continuous spectrum. So before the light reaches us, it would have some extra absorption bands which were not present there because of the star. This spectrum can be compared to the star's spectrum without the exoplanet in between to locate the dark lines only present in the spectrum when the planet was transitioning. These dark lines belong to the planet's atmosphere and were not because of the elements present in the star. In the year 2000, when Hubble studied the exoplanet 209458b, it found sodium in its atmosphere. In the atmosphere of exoplanet HD 189733b, located 63 light years away, Hubble detected methane. This was the first organic molecule identified in the atmosphere of a planet outside our solar system. There is again a Sciart comic explaining it on my Instagram handle. In the year 1970, Wilson and others discovered carbon monoxide molecules in the molecular clouds of the Orion Nebula complex for the first time by observing its spectra which is in the radio wavelength, includes a line of 2.6 millimeters. The discovery of carbon monoxide in the molecular clouds of nebulae was important because formation of simple molecules leads to the formation of dust clouds in the universe. A nebula is a cloud of dust and gas. So when these gases are heated by some nearby star, they get excited and emit an emission spectrum. If they are so oriented with respect to the observer that they block the star's light, they are called a dark nebula. Studies reveal the existence of magnesium, calcium, and titanium besides hydrogen and helium present in the Orion Nebula. Chemical analysis can help us determine whether a nebula is a stellar nursery where new stars form because of higher concentrations of hydrogen and helium or whether a Z formed due to the death of a star in a supernova which can be derived by the presence of more heavy elements in its spectrum. Spectra of galaxies is a little bit complex as it is a superposition of the spectra of all the stars making it up. 
But looking at that can give us an idea of the major population of the stars as young or old. Most stars will show dip in hydrogen and helium for sure, but the presence of other elements like chromium, strontium or titanium in higher or lower amounts help us understand the galaxy and its star formation and evolution much much better. In a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, scientists had discovered a cloud of ionized water in a quasar galaxy 12 billion light years away. The cloud orbits the central black hole and contains 140 trillion times more water than Earth, though in ionized form. A comic on the same has again been made on my Instagram handle and also on my website. Rovers and orbiters like Curiosity on Mars, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter around the Moon, Juno around Jupiter and numerous others are equipped with instruments called spectrometers which are capable of analyzing the reflected light coming from planets, moons and space rocks to identify the presence of various chemical substances in them. Sometimes they excite the soil samples just by shooting a beam of radiation to excite the atoms. This excitation of atoms of elements and compounds present in the soil makes the emission spectrum visible to the spectrometer, usually in the X-ray or UV range. This process has made us aware of the higher amounts of iron and nickel found on the far side of the moon. This amount is higher than previously thought and actually makes us rethink of our model of lunar formation. Cassini found the presence of light organic compounds like amines and carbonyls which were the precursors of amino acids in the plumes of Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. Organic compounds are what make life possible and amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Curiosity discovered organic compounds called theophenes on the Martian soil which are usually an indicator of a life supporting environment. Many more intriguing discoveries about the chemical makeup of our neighbors and the universe has been possible due to the spectral analysis of these objects. This video was just to explain to you how that is done and to understand the process. I hope you enjoyed watching this and learned more new things than you previously knew. In the next video of this series, we will learn how the motion of stars, galaxies, binary systems or the presence of exoplanets can be studied using their spectroscopy. Thank you so much for watching this video and please do not forget to like the video and follow the Astro Geek Comics by clicking on the subscribe button. If you want to be notified when I release the next videos, you may also click on the bell icon. In case of suggestions for future series and videos or your thoughts on this one, you can comment below. I would love to read them. Remember. You are the real MVPs whose support keeps me motivated to make more educational videos on astronomy and space science. The comic numbers of my Instagram comics mentioned by me in this video are mentioned in the description below. Until next time, stay curious and keep looking up.